one, good, and we are live. Maureen Shea, thank you for joining me today on the podcast. I really appreciate your time. No problem. My pleasure. Um, so for people that might not have heard about your story and who you are, um, tell them about your background and we'll kind of roll from there. Uh, well, I'm a two-time world champion boxer uh, with a record of 29-2 and two with 13 knockouts, um, ranked number one in the world in a few sanctioning bodies. Um, I also, a lot of people know me as the real Million Dollar Baby, as I worked with Hilary Swank for her Oscar award-winning role in the movie. Uh, we trained, I was an amateur at the time, I was uh, 24 years old, and uh, she came down to Brooklyn and we trained together for about six months. She worked with my boxing coach at the time, and I, she kind of studied me for the character, so I shared a lot about my life and sparred with her like three times a week and, and shared a lot of my life with her too, so a lot of people know me from that. Cool. How did that um, opportunity come around for for yourself? Like, how was you contacted, and you know, wh- how what made you want to jump on that opportunity? Um, well, it kind of it kind of happened by accident. I, I trained in Gleason's gym in Brooklyn, which is a very well known gym, and uh, I mean, tons of champions would come in, and a lot of actors and actresses would also come in to train, to work out, and for getting ready for movie roles. And Hillary was one of them. She came in, uh, it was actually a trainer that she was working with, or somebody recommended her to meet with my coach at the time, who was Hector Roca. So she came down to the gym, and then Hector paired me with her specifically because um, I fought at a lighter weight, so we were similar in um, in weight. And Hector also knew that I have control, so I never went in there. I, I knew how to work with certain people. I even worked with kids, or I'd work with what we call white-collar boxers, people that are, don't necessarily want to fight, but they just want to kind of spar and learn. So I had a lot of control and I always went in there to kind of work on what I had to do. So he knew putting me with her, I wouldn't retaliate if she caught me with a good shot. Um, I knew I had really good defense. So that's pretty much how it happened and why it happened. And we, we really, um, we connected, you know, I, I had a lot of respect. I have a lot of respect for anybody, especially females that get into that ring because it's, it's a scary place. And I know that firsthand because it was scary for me. And so working with her, I, I really appreciated her trust in me and I wanted to see her do well. Along with myself, I wanted to do well too, but I knew I had to work on certain things because me beating up an actress was not going to do anything for me, you know. So um, I made the work out of out of her, the work with her. Okay, and how did you get into boxing yourself? Like, what's what was your journey there, and kind of what motivated you to getting into that sport? Well, it's funny that I, I had never, I didn't know about boxing. I the only thing I knew was Mike Tyson. And I knew that because when I was, I think I was 15 or 16 years old, and um, it was when Mike Tyson bit Holyfield's ear. I was at a friend's house, and his father was having a fight party. We were hanging out in the kitchen, and all of a sudden there was like an uproar in the living room, and everybody went into the living room, and I went in there. I was like, what the heck is this? And it was just when Tyson bit his ear and spit it on the floor, and I was fascinated because I was like, oh, my God, like that's that's crazy. You know, like who does that? What is this? And then, you know, obviously there's like, oh, this is boxing. And what's interesting is that I connected with Mike Tyson's rage because I had a lot of misplaced rage as a kid and a lot of anger and a lot of emotional stuff. And um, I was like, not that I ever wanted to bite somebody's ear off like that, but I definitely felt that explosiveness inside um, that I wanted to just more reactive. So that's really what I connected with. And then fast forward a couple of years later, about three or four years later, um, I found myself in an abusive relationship. And um, I went to the gym to better myself for him. And I walked into the back and there was a boxing ring. So mind you, the last time I had ever heard about boxing was seeing that fight. It's not like I saw that fight and then decided to go into boxing. So I went to the back and I was like, all right, I know what this is. And then I said, you know, let's see, maybe that can help me. And uh, a trainer came up to me and he was very welcoming, Willie Soto, who I still speak to today. And he said, you know, do you want to try? And for me, it was more about how can I connect with these people? Because mind you, I'm in an abusive relationship with a pretty strong, muscular man. So being around strong, muscular men was something that I wasn't really wanting to jump into. But this coach was very nice and very kind. And I said, well, I speak fluent Spanish, that I'm half Mexican, half Irish. So I said, how can I connect? And I started speaking Spanish to him. And he immediately lit up knowing that I spoke Spanish because looking at me, you wouldn't even be able to tell that. And um, that was my connection. And then after that, I felt I felt safe. And he always made me feel safe. And I fell in love with the sport and it helped me in so many areas of my life. It helped me um, to go back to school. It helped me um, get out of that abusive relationship. And really, I like to say that boxing was the architect that rebuilt me because I, I was broken when I when I found the sport. That kind of touches on my next sort of question that I was going to ask you in the sense of how much has boxing had an effect on your life? Has it been mainly positive or completely positive? Have there been negative sides? You know, 
dealing with being in the limelight and stuff like that can be quite a strain sometimes for a lot of people. I think it's how what, how you take it and what you make of it. And, you know, I think with all good and bad, with any experience, you're going to have good and bad. And it's what you learn from or how you apply what you learn um, going forward. And it was, definitely wasn't a great, all great I mean, I came up in boxing during a time where women were considered a, a, an attraction or a sideshow. Women weren't even in the Olympics. That didn't happen until 2013. I started boxing, you know, I've been in the sport for 22 years. So I started when I was 27. And, uh, you know, getting fights, I had 12 amateur fights where girls now have over 100 because there's more opportunity. So it was definitely challenging. I felt like I had to break through like a glass ceiling. And I just kept trying and kept trying. And it was more my faith. And I just believed that there was a purpose. Like, I believe God had a purpose for my life. And it was just so weird because nothing, the only thing that led me to boxing was really my, my heritage, you know, being Mexican and Irish. So people are like, oh, no wonder you box because I wasn't raised in it. My parents didn't really push athletics. I mean, I played sports, but I never stuck to anything because I got bored. So I played softball, basketball, but it wasn't like I was this all-around athlete. I didn't even know I was an athlete. I didn't even know I was athletic until I started boxing, you know, until somebody told me, oh, you're athletic. And I was like, oh, okay. You know, so it was, that, that was really interesting. And um, the challenging parts of it, I think, are more so you know, being respected, you know, as, as a boxer. And I would always say, you know, there's no masculine or feminine way of saying boxer. You're just a boxer. And people would tell me, oh, you're too pretty or why do you do this and you don't want to ruin your face and you know, you're smart. You can do so many other things. And I'm like, okay, but you know, you don't look like a fighter. I'm like, well, even though I don't look like a fighter, I have a fight in here that you don't know about. And, um, I had to learn to stop defending myself to these people because that was just wasted energy and just live in my purpose and try to figure out my purpose. And, um, that was challenging. That was probably the biggest challenge was I had a guy one time in Gleason's, uh, former world champion say to me, you don't look like a fighter. You look like you should be home baking pies. And I looked at him and I said, well, I don't know how to bake pies. And then he said, well, you know, fighters, you know, they've done time. They've been in jail. And I'm pretty witty. And my dad kind of, I got that from my dad. And I turned around. And I said, well, how do you know I haven't done time? How do you know I'm not a, I'm not a, I'm not a murderer? You have no idea. Just because I don't look like it. And he just looked at me. And he, I think that made him think I was crazy. But I'm like, but it's the truth. And I learned, like, don't judge a book by its cover because I was judged so much. But I also learned, again, with that negative, I, was, I also learned that I can't please everybody and I can't tap dance for everybody and I can't do this for anybody but myself and that took time you know and experience to learn that and to figure out what my why was which I know now what my why is which I had to learn because I didn't know for a long time that that was even important yeah I mean when you establish what your why is I think that's part of what drives you to then end up being successful in the field that you choose to go in right oh mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, um, you know, because you understand, like I started boxing, you know, when I started, it was to get out of the abusive relationship. But what really was just to actually was to get to look better for him because I went in there with very low self-esteem. I thought I was fat and ugly. And then I, I, I suffered through that where, you know, I was anorexic and I lost my gallbladder at 17 years old. And I had, fully, I had a fully infected gallbladder and I had to have emergency surgery because I didn't think I had to eat. And boxing helped me there too, because in order to box, I wanted boxing more than I wanted to be skinny. So I had to eat in order to box well, you know, because I had no strength. And so that, that helped me in that area. And then, um, it, then it became, because my dad, my parents found out, my dad said, you know, in this house, you have to work and go to school. You can't do all three. And I said, well, watch me. So I went to school, I worked and I boxed. So then I boxed for a long time to prove my dad wrong. You know, it was then a million dollar baby happened. Then after million dollar baby, I boxed to show that I'm not just a sparring partner, that I'm in this too, you know? And then it went on from there. But now my why, my why is simple now. At, at 39 years old, it's because I can. Because I can. It's that simple. It's just because I can. And I'm good at it. So why not? I don't have to, but I can. So I do it. I think that's um, quite a good mindset that I think a lot of people need to try and establish. I speak to a lot of people um, who, are, who are training and sometimes they lack motivation, for example, and I'm always kind of like, you should just be doing this for you because you have the opportunity to. It doesn't necessarily have to be to prove someone wrong or right. Um, and I think but that's quite that, a... Go on. But if you're driving force for a while, that gets old. 
And then when that person disappears and doesn't care anymore, then what is it? You know what I mean? But I think that I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing when people start because of that. And then they have to learn to discover, you know, that that real thing. And it's 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 owning your truth, but it's also learning your truth. And I don't even know if some people even know what that means. They're still discovering it. You know, like I said, you know, the way that I think now in my 30s was not the same as I thought in my 20s. But it was those experiences, good and bad, that led me to this place now. And and to kind of have that mindset and to like, okay, and, and not be so reactive to it. Not be so quick to pull the trigger with emotion. Because that's something that I learned in boxing that you can't fight with. You can fight with passion and a desire, but you better not fight with emotion because you're going to get tired real quick. So when did you know you was sort of any good at the sport of boxing? When was that kind of uh, epiphany where you was like, actually, I'm, I'm pretty good at this. I want to, you know, I want to start taking some professional bouts and now I want to go for the title and so forth. You know, it's funny. It took me so long because I had such low self-esteem for so long and I was bullied too, you know, and, and even in the sport, I got a little bullied by people, you know, a lot of jealousy with Million Dollar Baby and things like that where people didn't think I deserved it. And I was an amateur at the time, you know, and, and I didn't really understand. Like my first amateur fight, just to give you an idea of where my self-esteem was, my first amateur fight, I, I won the fight and I clearly beat her like, you know, unanimously. But I looked at the referee and I said, I really lost, didn't I? And he looked at me like, what the hell's wrong with this lady? But that's how low my self-esteem was. I did, Even when I won, I thought I lost because I was just so broken. So it took, it was me just showing up and just doing it and almost like faking it till I made it. You know, I thought like, all right, well, really my, my coaches wanted to still train me and I had coaches and then I had to say, well, do they want to train me because I'm good or because they think I'm cute or they just want to train the pretty girl? Like, why do they really want to train me? So... I went through a lot to get to that point where I'm like, oh, wow, like I'm actually good. And to answer your question about the title, I never dreamed of being a world champion. I just said, okay, what's next? I fight to win. Whether there's a title in line or not, I fight to win and I fight to execute the work that I do and, and do it, try to do it well. So for me, it wasn't so much about winning a world title. I just wanted to be the best in that fight and every fight after that, like what was next. And I always want to continue being the best. And I think that kept me really grounded because I didn't look too far ahead. I just had to say, okay, like when I had, I have two losses. So I said, okay, when I lost the fight, okay, what did I do wrong? I didn't blame anybody. I looked at what the problems were, whether it was myself first and, you know, and then looking at my camp or my team or what went wrong there and we would discuss it and then we'd go into the next fight, you know, and I have to make those adjustments. So, you know, I don't know if that's that's weird to some people because some people are like, oh, I dreamt of being a world champion. Like, I'm going to be the world. I'm like, I'm going to be the best me I could be and win, like, whatever it is. And if the title's there, great. I'm still just going to go out there and win. Yeah, I mean, I think that's quite a, a strong mindset to have. I'm, I would say I'm fairly similar, and I think, in the sense of whenever I do anything competitive or whatever I'm doing I always want to win I always want to kind of do the best that I can possibly do and bring to the table and I don't understand and it's something that I'm trying to work on myself is that those people that just do things for a little bit of fun for example I'm kind of just like don't you don't you just want to get good and win and, and be the best <laughs> like why why are you training if you're not committed to that training like why are you why are you fighting if you're not committed to that and you know it's a hard lesson to learn but those people learn a hard lesson because it's not this game i mean especially with boxing and that's what i loved about it too because it's very unforgiving and boxing taught me things that my parents couldn't teach me you know because um you know i'm very i'm very strong-minded i'm very stubborn and, you know, you get stubborn in that ring, you get punched in the face. <laughs> so you better adjust. You know, it's not like, you know, I'm stubborn with my parents. I get punished or I get in trouble or I get grounded. You know what I mean? Something like that. It's like, okay, big deal. Like, you're, I mean, it's a little bit brutal, but, you know, it's, it's, it's a hard lesson to learn. So I think that when um, people just do things. But again, I, you know, everybody, different strokes for different folks. And everybody's got a purpose and a journey. And, you know, I know mine. And. I love this, you know, I love this quote that I found the other day. It's when you stay in your own lane, there's no traffic. And I just try to stay in my own lane and just do me and focus on me and not worry about what the next person is doing or the same thing with running the race. 
you know, you know, you, you, you can't, if you run a race, it's like, you know, when you're swimming, you're running, you're swimming a race or, you know, you're not going to look at the person next to you because you're going to slow down. You're going to lose that time. So don't worry about what everybody else is doing. Just focus on what you're doing. And that's hard. That's hard because, you know, people, people poke the bear sometimes and people try to get you to, you know what I mean? And, you know, and it's okay because we're human. It happens. But then I got to reset course and reset. Okay, no, this is where I got to go. Yeah, I mean, I think um, I one of my biggest downfalls is that I'm a snappy guy. <laughs> so <laughs> when people are getting involved in my shit, I'm quite snappy. And uh, a lot of people have said it's it's little man syndrome for me because I'm a I'm, I'm a short guy. So <laughs> so I'm always like fiery. I'm just like don't get involved. I think, well, I get the same way, and I think it's being a female where I feel like I ha- I sometimes I defend myself when I don't have to, and I always feel like I have to be fight harder you know and and i know but i recognize it but you recognize that that's huge that you recognize it and then if you want to make the adjustment make it but if that's who you are and you like who you are don't worry about what other people think it's too bad you know they don't got to be in your life then that's how i look at it anyway because i'm like if you don't like me i mean listen there's people that i love in my life that i ask them like what do you think or if they say to me hey listen i noticed this about you but i know they genuinely love me and i take into consideration what everybody says but in the day it's up to me to make those changes if I choose to. And if I don't, then I have to deal with the, with the outcome, which could be maybe not having this person in my life or that person in my life, you know, cause I'm not willing to adjust for everybody, but I'm also open-minded enough to say, you know what, you're right. Like I can, I can probably fix that or I can be better at that. And I think that's, that's a very strong mind, but don't get that twisted with, I'm going to let somebody tell me who I am and what I got to do to be better. I know, you know, but that's, that's a champion mentality. You know, knowing yourself, owning your truth, but be still being open to listen to the people and having the circle around you, the people you trust that can give you, you know, constructive criticism. And then you, you consider it and you're like, okay, but if not, who cares? You can't please everybody. Yeah. I mean, uh, I, I would say I've got a, uh, champion's mentality. Um, I'm going to go with, I'm the champion of doing fuck all. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, if you're gonna be good at something you've got to be good at it right so that that i'll get a title yep. for that at some point yep yep um how did you cope with your uh nerves so like pre-fight nerves and things like that did they hinder your performance do you feel like being nervous brought the best out of you um i'm a fighter so for me it's like my nerves i mean in the beginning you know, the nerves really were just in the first round or like the first minute of the first round. And then after that, I, I genuinely felt like I was at home. I felt like I belonged here because there was this like this like side of me. And I don't want to say like a like a demonic side, but there was a side of me that I literally become a different person. And I no longer look because I'm a very loving, compassionate, empathetic person. But when it comes to a fight, I'm like, you're a target. You're not a human. You're a target. You know, and I'm going to, you know, I'm, I, I, I throw punches with bad intentions and I'm going to, I'm going to dominate. So that's always my mentality going in. But the first round and anybody will tell you, it's always like, all right, what's well, it's, it's pretty much, I think the nerves come from the unknown where like, okay, what's going to happen? Like, is this person like, how hard did they hit? Is it going to be like this? going to be like that. Like, what's the rhythm? Am I going to find my timing? Like that kind of stuff. But that, that goes out the window. And I, you know, after the first like minute for me. And then I find that um, I go into the ring with a confidence and it's a confidence in my work. It's a calmness because I genuinely know that this is where I belong. And I know now wholeheartedly that I'm good and that nobody I know that there's no female out there that has my style. I know that for me, but I also have been told that by multiple people. They're like, I've never seen anybody move like that. And I'm like, yeah, because I've made my style my own. And um, that really trips up a lot of people. So what kind of training are you doing at the moment for yourself to help keep yourself in shape? um, And, you know, obviously keeping your knowledge up to scratch as well, because obviously you do the coaching side of things with with athletes. That kind of happened by accident, which is interesting. And we'll we'll touch on that because that's an interesting story. But um well, I'm getting ready. I'm, I'm still active. I'm still fighting. Um, I fought in January. And the good thing about being a veteran of the sport and, and um, you know, I t- I've always taken care of my body. Um, anybody who knows me knows that I'm like I've been told people always come at you're so disciplined. Like, where do you find the motivation? And I'm like, because I know my why. 
and I'm honest with myself. And I, I genuinely love what I do. Even if I wasn't fighting, I would still be in shape. I would still be training. You know, I had a sparring session the other day that was kind of like, you know, mentally going into it. I was, I mean, I was good, but then I was kind of like, it's funny, people might trip out of this, but I'm like, I don't want to be here. <laughs> I don't want to be here right now. So, you know, my coaches understand me and they trust me enough to say, okay, well, then we'll just end this morning session because I don't need to prove anymore how tough I am. I don't need to prove how disciplined or motivated I am. It's like, you know what? She's having an off day. Why are we going to force her? You don't want to force, force a, a square peg into a circle, you know? So they're like, all right. And I said, I know it's mental. It's not physical because I go strength train later on and I want to be there. So let's just take a moment, step away from the boxing, and then just go over there. I love that, you know, between Phil and Derek, uh, you know, Phil Drew and Derek Santos, and my manager, Luis Chese, I have such an amazing team around me, and they genuinely accept me. And it's funny because they all have the same person, similar personalities, where they're all very calm and laid back, and I'm the spitfire. So being with them brings me, it's like a yin and a yang. They really balance me. And, um, you know, Phil's dedication to his athletes, along with Derek's, and understanding the personalities is just so – it's such a breath of fresh air. And it's and knowing how to work with females. You know, Phil is his first strength and conditioning coach that has the amount of – has worked with elite females, you know, because he worked with MMA, you know, that I ever worked with. Most of the guys, I kind of broke them in into the training females. That was tough, you know. But finally, having it just so so like this, it's, it's, it's nice. And so I guess, you know – I well, imagine your question with, 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 you know, nerves and things like that. Like it's really a confidence in yourself and it's a confidence in your game plan and the rest is in God's hands. That's how I look at it. I'm like, you know what? I did my part. The rest is, you know, up to that. So what, how would you best describe your coaching technique, your coaching style? Are you quite like fiery with people all up in their grill or is it case by case basis? It's yeah, I would say it's a case by case basis. Um, I love and, and Phil taught me about doing um, an athlete assessment. You know, he does the Braverman's test. And I, I like that sitting and speaking with an athlete. Um, for whatever reason, they come to me. And I sit there and I kind of hear them. And it's funny, as a woman, I hear things that they say that a man might not say, where they may not say it, but I hear I hear the message, if that makes sense. Um, because I've been through a lot. You know, I've been through a lot, whether it's an abusive relationship, I've been, you know, um, I've suffered with anorexia, like I told you, compulsive eating disorders, um, you know, depression, like I've been through it all. And I kind of hear little bits of pieces of me in those women. And I kind of know, like, how I had to handle myself during that time. I know how to handle them. Or I'll try to approach them a similar way and see if it works. But it's really a case-by-case -case basis, um, depending on, on them. Like, you know, I'm working with Steffi Cohen, for example, and you know who she is, 25-time world record-breaking powerlifter, and who wants to box. Now, then I have a young girl, and they actually sparred today. Then I have another girl, um, Kessie Estevez, who you know works in business, and she's beautiful, and she's you know she runs. She's more of like the weekend warrior fitness, but she's got this warrior inside of her, and she likes to box. And I'm like, all right, they're two very different personalities, but I have to approach them differently. I can never disregard Steffi just because she's new in boxing. I'm not going to disregard what she's achieved in the powerlifting world. She's an elite athlete in her own right. She is. Even though she's not an elite boxer, she's still an elite athlete. So I need to approach her with that confidence and that belief in her. Where Kessie has never really competed at a level of, of like Steffi, but she also has something inside of her in business. And in ed education, where even Steffi has that, because Steffi's also a doctor of physical therapy. But Kessie also has multiple degrees. So I approach her with that, you know, coming from that angle. So I think you have to look at the athlete and see where their strong points are and then work off those. Because the weak points will either grow and get stronger or they'll disappear. But you got to tap into the strengths. What is the, um, I think you said it's the Braverman's test, is that right? Yeah. I What's that for people that might not know? It asks if they try to figure out if they're like, um, uh, like what they're dominant in, like what they're like, if they're, um, uh, I, I guess it's like they're, um, you know, I have one even next to me. I don't know if he has a drawer open because I'll read it to you. They'd have to look it up, but it looks like, like if they're alpha, beta, like things like that. And if they're dopamine dominant and think, you know, and how the training, how you have to approach them and, 
you know, um, that kind of thing. And it kind of gives a little bit more of the personality based on these questions that are asked. Okay. So almost like a, a personality test to an extent yeah. of like, yeah. now I know how yeah. to approach you and now I know yeah. how to train you. Yeah, okay. exactly. And I love that Phil does that because I've seen him do it. And it's funny, you know, I'm his executive assistant as well, which not a lot of people know that because that's my business side that I need to work that business side of my brain. And, um, you know, working with him, I see, I, I've learned so much from him. And um, that's something that I love that he does. You know, and him and I, when I first met him, he talked to, we talked for like over an hour when I met him in 2016. That's when I started working with him. And because I, at that point, I didn't just, you know, I'm already a world champion, you know, two-time world champion. I'm not just going to go work with anybody, but he came highly recommended by a very good friend of mine. And I knew he was working with some elite level um, combat athletes. So I said, okay, well, let's see, because I don't know who he's worked with in boxing, you know, and, and I wanted to talk to him, but he let me talk and he kind of gave me a Braverman's test without ever, without even giving it to me because I'm an easy, I'm easy to read. You know, I just, I'm just like, blah, here I am. And I know that, and he realized that right away, because I just kept talking, you know, and he was like, okay. But he asked some questions that he felt he needed to get feedback on, and I think, you know, he knows me so well, like so well. Yeah, I mean, uh, one thing that I've gathered from Phil when I've spoke to him is that he's very quick at assessing things and kind of knowing people's personalities quite well, as well as so much knowledge he's got so much knowledge honestly sometimes when i talk to him i'm like phil uh, i'm lost mate <laughs> i'm lost with you yeah he's so smart and you know and i love that but i, I appreciate the way that he thinks because I, I think that way too when i'm talking about boxing where i'll go into a whole explanation about why a fighter is doing a certain thing now the way that i speak to it with derek is going to be different than the way I talk to it, talk about it with somebody who may know boxing, but doesn't really know the science behind it or understand the, the strategy and the technique behind it. You know, even some of the MMA fighters that I talk with, you know, one of the guys that's out here right now, Keith Speed, you know, he'll come to me and, or, you know, he's working with Derek now, but he comes to me and he'll say, so what if I do this, this, and this? I'm like, well, you could go this way and then this will happen or because I could do this, and then he's like, oh, but he's thinking MMA. He's thinking, you know, going for a takedown. He's not thinking strictly hands, you know, so I'm giving him the boxing side of it. And um, and I think it's so important for, for MMA fighters to understand that too, even though they don't necessarily just, just punch. Boxing and striking is very different, first of all. Let me tell you that. They're, and people don't understand that. They're like, oh, you're striking. I'm like, no, they're boxing. If they're in a boxing gym and they're boxing, they're boxing. They're not striking. They strike in like Muay Thai or, you know, that's different. That's like pad and a different strategy. It's not, it's not boxing. It just frustrates me when people say that about with MMA fighters. Because mm. I can watch a fight and I'm like, oh, yeah, he's a good striker. But this guy is a good boxer. And yeah. Dustin Poirier, for example. I've watched Dustin's development. He works with a, with a very good friend of mine, Daya Davis, for his boxing. And Daya is a former uh, NABF champion and was a, box, was a boxer. He's retired. And then he worked with Derek Santos, who's my boxing trainer. And um, – I can see Dustin's boxing coming out. I see his striking, but I see his boxing coming out too. Because there's moves that are boxing, not striking. Yeah. I mean, I've watched, uh, I'm a massive fan of Dustin's, um, and I've watched a lot of his his fights, and I can say that you've definitely seen a progression from striking to boxing. Um, and He's a perfect as well example as, of it. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I call him the uh, Channing Tatum of the UFC world. That's, that's been my nickname for him for, for a while now. And I, I keep tweeting it. Maybe one day I'll get a retweet from him when he realises. Um, but yeah, no, uh, I've lost my trail of thought there, which is unbelievable. Um, Coaching-wise, that's what we were going on. Yeah. Um, so yeah, obviously you're coaching uh, athletes. How is Steffi getting on with her boxing and how have you helped to progress her? Um, well, the thing with, with Steffi is I have limited time with Steffi because she lives in Miami, so she's far from me. Um, but she sees me twice a week, and she works with another coach who's a, a Muay Thai coach. He's not a boxing coach, but he'll do mitt work with her. You know, it's very different from my style and my tech, my technical um, um, type of training, but it's good for her, you know, because she can learn with me, and then she can apply down there. And he may throw in some little things that may work. 
and then I'll see it, but I, and I'll see it either in the video or I'll watch her in training. I'm like, no, that's not really going to work, you know, um, and this is why. Or it may work for her because I'm not totally opposed to, you know, somebody, like, like I said, I do things that are unconventional. And people are like, wow, I'm like, yeah, I can do it. You may not be able to do it. So there may be things that she can do that other people may not be able to do. And I'm open to that as well. Um, but she's doing very well. She's very smart. Um, she's very cerebral. And when I say that, I find that that was a thing that people didn't understand with me because I am I have a very quick mind and I process things very fast. Um, I'm also, you know, um, I love school. I always loved school. I didn't necessarily like to be in a classroom, but I do like to learn. Um, my problem with school was I have ADHD, so I would get bored real quick if you weren't keeping up to pace and I'd check out. But boxing doesn't let you do that because you're, and I like to be physical. So it's perfect for anybody with ADHD. So if you have ADHD, you should learn how to box because it'll be great, great therapy. Um, so with her, um, she's very studious. And I find that women like to understand, um, that need to understand before they can apply. And that was a problem that I had coming up in the sport because men are very black and white and women are more detail oriented. So some men, it didn't matter. They would just do the move because they can do the move where women could do the move to do the move. But if they understand the move, the move is more likely to stick. So I love that about her, that she understands that, you know, where I say, okay, this is why. And they don't even have to ask me, but she'll stop and ask me because I always let them know, ask me if you don't understand, because I will have an answer. I want you to understand it because I know that you'll be able to apply it. And I didn't have that. I was told because I said so or just do it. And I was like, so I would have to go home and watch fights on TV and try to figure out moves. And then I would go to the gym and do those moves. And then my coach is like, oh, all right, well, let me show you. I've kind of massaged like it's almost like that ego thing where it's like, oh, she can do that. All right, well, let me let me teach her. Meanwhile, he didn't teach me. He just showed me how to do the, the move and where. But I already did the move because I studied the tape to watch it. Arturo Gotti was somebody I swing on the ropes. I learned that watching Arturo Gotti, you know, um, even with Mike Tyson, you know, I, I learned kind of like my head movement. Sometimes I'll come in and I watched Mike Tyson do that. Roy Jones. I love, I love to have the shaky shoulders like Roy Jones, you know, dropping my hands and throw punches. So even Floyd Mayweather, I'll do the shoulder roll, you know, but I'll apply it to my style, you know, um, but I take from all these fighters, um, and I try to apply it, but that's another thing. So going back to that, she's definitely coming along, um, and it's sticking and I'm we're starting to develop her style because you don't necessarily look at a fighter and go, I'm going to know her style. I mean, I'm going to know her style because she's going to fight at 125. So the girls are going to be taller than her because she's short and, um, you know, but she's got very strong legs. She's got a really good foundation and she's very strong and she's quick. She's explosive. So now it's just working the technique and working on the head movement and the countering. Seems like we've got a... Uh, another Mike Tyson then basically <laughs> get that head movement that bob and a weave in and then bang yeah, she's strong um, she actually caught my girl today with a, with a jab and my girls uh, she's Cassie's about I don't know five six five seven and and Steffi's like four eleven I think you know so I mean and but she threw the perfect jab but I, we said I had a game plan for both of them because I coached both of them so I had one day with Cassie and I coached Kessie on the game plan for Steffi, and then I coached Steffi on the game plan for Kessie. Now, mind you, Kessie's got more experience and more ring experience. This is the first time Steffi ever sparred. So, you know, I had to tell Kessie, listen, work with her a little bit, but get your work in. But the reason that Steffi caught her was because Kessie squared up. And I said, but Kessie knew right away what she did wrong and why she got caught, and then she adjusted it. That's what I love about these women. And then Steffi, again, she had to make some adjustments too. You know, and there's things that she doesn't really know how to get away from yet. But, you know, the one thing about her is she's definitely a fighter. There's no question about that. She's very competitive, which I love. But now we have to use that and start to just kind of mold the uh, technical aspect of it. So in a different sort of um, category, I guess, you're training Paige Van Zandt for bare knuckle at the moment. What sort of things are you doing with her? And obviously she's got quite a vast amount of experience as well. So that's an interesting, that's an interesting case. I, I'm not, I'm actually not, I'm no longer training Paige Van Zant for bare knuckle. I was training her. She did come to me and ask me and we were, and, and, um, you know, I actually haven't spoken about this publicly yet, but, um, you know, it's very difficult. Uh, you know, Paige, she, you know, she's still an MMA fighter. And as the coach, I have an approach to an athlete. 
and there's things that I can do and I can't do because I know it's going to affect my coaching and I'm not going to be able to give the fighter, you know, 100% of me. So, you know, she's still, it's very important to her still while she's training for bare knuckle that she still continues with her MMA. And for me, that's very difficult. Um, I, I think my personal feelings was that I thought she should kind of put MMA aside for a little bit and kind of focus on the boxing side of things. But again, it's her career, it's her life. I support her in whatever she does, but I know what I can do and what I can't do. So, um, you know, having seen her work, she's an athlete. Um, I think that she has, you know, some things that could work with bare knuckle, but there's some, there's a lot of things that we needed to work on. I really needed her focus to be on just that because what I noticed with MMA fighters also is that when it comes to just doing their hands, they always, they always end up wanting to throw a kick or wanting to do something else. So for her, I think if you're going to trans, if you're going to completely go into a boxing, cause that's what bare knuckle is, it's boxing. You really need to be boxing. That's my opinion, my professional opinion. But again, like I said, you know, she um, she still wants to do her MMA and and we parted amicably like there's no ill will. I just say, you know, this is something that I, I just I just, you know, I can't do. And if this is the choice you're, you're making and you think this is the, what's best for you, just make sure it's what you want and what's best for you. You know, um, you know, I, I wish you the best, you know, so um, so it was it was a little I was, you know, this is the thing with fighters. I'm a fighter, too. I've switched coaches. You know what I mean? I have to go where I feel what's best for me. You know, and she did it very respectfully and there's no, there's no, like I said, there's no ill will. And I've done that with my old coaches respectfully. I have a great relationship with all of them because I parted, we parted ways amicably because I explained what I needed. And if they couldn't give it to me, then I would expect them not to want to be able to train me. Or if I couldn't get what I needed, then I'd have to go. So, you know, I think that's, that's where it ended. But, you know, I think, um, listen, Paige is athletic. Um, she's got, I, you know, she's got, she's got a, a commitment to it. And, and I, I, you know, I support her and I, I hope that she does well, you know, and I'll be, I'll definitely be, be rooting for her. Yeah. I mean, I can see it from your standpoint as well, uh, because like you said, obviously there is a big difference between boxing and MMA, even the way you set punches up and throwing combinations. If you've got that habit of wanting to throw a kick or something after your well, footwork's going to be off. And this is where a lot of people get this mistaken. Muay Thai and boxing are polar opposites. Just because you punch doesn't mean that that's, you know, Muay Thai is very different. Your first of all, their hands are here. You know, boxing, your hands are here. Your feet, you're more up on your toes. You bounce back a lot because you go to throw a kick or a knee. Where in boxing, you need to have that kind of stable ground and you need to be have, have full rotation. Where um, Muay Thai, they don't rotate as much as boxers. You know, and I, I saw that. I see that with a lot of MMA fighters when it comes to rotation. They, they struggle with the rotation, with the punches, or they just stay. They throw the right hand. They just stay there. They don't pull it back, you know, because they'll go here, and then maybe they'll go for a takedown if they're a wrestler. I find that wrestlers, um, you know, stay in this position, so they're very squared up when they're here, you know. Um, I've been around MMA fighters enough to see. I used to train around Tony Ferguson. Um, I was part of uh, Tony was part of my team when I trained in in uh, Ventura, California, and I remember watching Tony. And Tony is just like he's he throws punches from everywhere, but his boxing is solid. You know, he's got solid boxing, especially his uppercut. He definitely places that uppercut. You know, and um, I remember walking to the gym. I didn't know who it was after he just won the 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 um, the Ultimate Fighter, and I remember he was in there, and I was just like, you know, and he was always. Very cordial. He actually taught me how to sprawl, which is pretty cool. But he, you know, because the, the MMA fighters, when I would be shadow boxing, they'd be doing their boxing. One of them would always try to take me down. I was like, I'm going to learn how to sprawl and I'm going to shock everybody. Um, but anyway, he, um, you know, he was seeing him hit the bag. I was like, wow, like, you know, he really dedicated his a lot of his focus to his boxing when he was there. And he still does. He works. He was working with another friend of mine, Rashad Holloway, who's a former fighter as well. You know, I, I love how these. MMA fighters, the ones that really understand that boxing is valuable, that they get boxing people to do their boxing because <laughs> that's what you want to do. You know what I mean? You don't want to get a Muay Thai guy to teach you boxing because it's not the same. You know, you want to get boxing people. And it's not a knock to anybody else. It's just fact. You know, I mean, I may ruffle a couple feathers by saying that, but I'm just speaking. No, it's true. I mean, at the end of the day, if you're ill, you go and see a doctor, right? You're not going to go and see well, if I don't I, know, yeah, someone gonna... down the road. For, for, for a foot problem, you know? Yeah. 
exactly yeah. special if that's that's the point is specializing in the field and then approaching that person and being like look your speciality is this this is what i need to improve in or this is what i'm going into so can you and, teach me and i have no problem listen and for me it's not about not gonna say, oh, it's not about the money no it, it's not i mean i get paid for my time but at the same time i'm not gonna say i'm not gonna say i can help you when i can't you know, so I always meet with a person before. I have a very selective few fighters that I train. I don't just train everybody. You know, I'm not, that's not what I do. You know, that's not my full time job. You know, my full time job is fighter and assistant to Phil. And trust me, being an assistant to Phil, it's a full time job. You know, he's a very busy man. And I'm, I'm running a lot of his schedule and, and, and including the gym, the facility that he opened, you know, um, and I love it. But, um, you know, you know, he even asked me, you know, why do you do it? I'm like, because I love it. Like, I love doing. Leave a comment. No, do you need me to get out of your office? No, I'm leaving. Oh, okay. Phil's leaving. But I was just complimenting how I love training, how I love working for you. I'll talk to you later. Bye, right, Britt. <laughs> See you later, Phil. Right. So, you know, um, it's, it's, it's selective for me to work with them because I, it's, I want them to want to work with me. And, and I, I have to be able to, you know, connect with them. And, and I'm okay telling a fighter, like, it's, it's not going to work. I, you know, it, it'll never be, it's not an ego thing. It's because I care about, I'm a fighter and I've been taken advantage of and I've been hurt in there and I've been abused as a fighter. And I would never ever do that to another fighter. And and I'd never use another fighter. I would never, I can't, my, my, my soul won't let me do it. Yeah, I've had that um, conversation with other coaches before and it's kind of the same that they'll meet and talk with them see that they're on the same wavelength and they're like okay we can work together but they never go oh, i'll just take this person on just because they can pay me you know because fundamentally you know you can't give your 100 percent time to them or help them in the way they need especially in combat sports you're dealing with high risk situations you know it's not it's not like well, that's, picking flowers that's like, exactly and i look at it with bare knuckle especially that's very high risk, you know? That's a higher risk than boxing, in my opinion, because your face, like, you know, listen, I know, listen, Paige is tough. There's no doubt that that girl has heart, but like, I don't want my face to get messed up. You know what I mean? Like in boxing, that's why I got great head movement. I've already broken my nose when I didn't learn how to do that, but I don't want to get hit. I don't got to prove that. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's just me. But yeah, it's, it's a very, it's, that's a very, very, um, you know, I commend her for doing it because it's I was actually approached by David Feldman to fight for him for me it was the risk wasn't worth the reward and I'm in a place in my boxing career that I'm up here so I'm not like it just it just didn't make sense for me you know um but and she's younger so she felt that she was and it's, she's in a better position to take that risk um where for me it's not calculated again I, it's for me it's not about the money it's about what's best for me and I can yeah. make <laughs> so I'll go yeah. anywhere else and make I have to you know what I mean like I'll figure out a way I'm a hustler Mm. I mean, I, as well as um, I think that the UFC wasn't necessarily paying her what she was worth. That's necessary. That's that's what I've gathered through, like obviously media sources and things like that. And I think she has kind of mentioned that a few times, um, whether and the I, UFC I, haven't offered her a contract or something. And I respect her, and she's done the same thing with bare knuckles. She she demanded, she wanted a, a specific amount, and she got it. And I think that's great. I think that she, I'm, I'm very, um, you know, for, listen, people don't know that that girl turned pro when she was 19. She was a baby. You know what I mean? Like, I remember when I was 19, I didn't even have my first amateur fight when I was 19. So for what she's done and where she is and what she's doing, there's a lot of pressure and there's a lot of things being thrown at you. And there's, you know, it's, it's, it's tough. It's tough. And, and I, you know, I just, um, you know, like I said, I said to her, you know, I'm here for you as a woman and as an athlete, you know, um, and and I wish her the best. Yeah, I think fingers think crossed well. she uh, wins uh, yeah. her fight. That's the way I look at it because uh, uh, it'll be good for her, definitely on that. So what are um, what are the future plans for yourself? What have you got lined up? What's going on? Well, I'm ranked. I'm ranked number one in the world in a few in, in two weight classes and two sanctioning bodies. So um, I'm excited. You know, I'm excited for for stuff. Um, women's boxing is interesting. You know, they, um, you know, boxing is always very interesting. There's, there's politics, there's some stuff. And, you know, it was very interesting for me when it comes to these promoters, 
they started signing a lot of um, these girls that came from the Olympics because a lot of the work was done for them, which was the promoting of them, where women like myself and there's other women that are around with me that didn't get that exposure, that we came up the hard way. And, um, you know, some of those promoters kind of bypassed us a little bit. So I'm self-promoted. I'm very proud to say that I'm self-promoted. Um, and I, you know, as my record stands, you know, 29 wins, two losses and 13 knockouts. Um, I'm two time world champion. I've fought for every single, I have one draw for a world title that I thought I won, but I got a draw and another one that I lost. My first title attempt was when I was 13 and 0. And, um, it's, you had a question and I, actually this was, it brings the question to mind. My toughest fight, um, was actually that fight. You know, I fought for Bob Arum, uh, top rank and, uh, Bob wanted to sign me and said I could be the face of women's boxing. I was 26 or 27 and I was 13 and 0. And I actually went into that fight without my coach because my coach had to go to uh, another country with another fighter. And um, I couldn't pass up on the opportunity. And so I took that fight without my coach in my corner. And I, I dropped my opponent the first round. I was very confident going in to win until I blew my eardrum in the fifth round. And I fought for five rounds with no equilibrium. And I had never blown my eardrum before. And um, that was tough because I went down in the 10th round. There was 30 seconds left in the 10th round and I went down because I literally couldn't stand up anymore. I was fighting on muscle memory and will. And going back to your corner and having my manager was in my corner who he had trained me for a little bit in the beginning of my career, but hearing his voice and not Hector's voice was just very, you know, it was just not the same. And, and I felt like Hector would have known I was hurt. Um, I was very good at, at not showing it because I didn't even know, you know what I mean? I was so confused. And um, I got up, I got up, and the ref looked at me and he saw confusion in my face because I don't know why I went down because of my balance, that he stopped the fight, 30 seconds left. And that was probably the hardest fight for me to fight through and to come back from because I said, I remember looking at her going, that's my belt. Like, I just lost, and the opportunity that I lost. You know, Bob Arum signed Michaela Meyer. Uh, you know, after she went to the Olympics and, you know, and I'm glad that's great, but that could have been me. But again, I have faith and I believe that everything happens for a reason. And that was one of the difficult, uh, difficult um, struggles in my career. But look at where I am now. And I'm glad that I'm glad that Bob Aram kept the open mind and signed Michaela because now she's got an opportunity. So and I'm still succeeding, thriving and happy. And that's really what matters. And I know people are like, oh, but that would have been good if it was you. Of course it would have been great if it was, but it wasn't. So what am I supposed to do? Get mad and be mad at Michaela for getting the opportunity? Like, I can't. It's stupid. It's wasted energy. I was telling Phil the day, I'm like, I got this much emotional energy in a day. <laughs> you know, I got to really be specific where I can place it. And I give a lot to my girls. You know, to my clients, I give a lot because I also train a woman who doesn't want to fight. I train girls that don't want to fight. I train some that don't know if they want to fight. I have a 17-year-old, a 20-year-old. Um, I have a 38-year-old. Well, 39 now. I got a 27, another 27-year-old, another 27-year-old, and and an, and, a, and a 30-year-old who has no desire to fight. She just wants she's she's you know she just wants to learn how to how to box. And I do an intro to women's boxing class on Saturday mornings, which is a passion project for me that I do at a gym called Delray Boxing Gym because I feel like if I teach more women how to box, maybe more women will become fans of boxing and female boxing. So it's a win-win. How the hell do you manage your time? <laughs> Let me tell you, my mother, it's so funny because I've always been like this. I have a lot of energy, clearly. I did stadiums today. I trained Steffi and Kessie. I did stadiums with the guys and with Phil. And now I'm here and I have to go watch some sparring at uh, another gym in a little while just to be an extra set of eyes. But, um, you know, I love what I do. When you love what you do, it's easy. It really is. And I make sure that I have balance. So I, I, I go to therapy. I'm a big believer in therapy. I have a therapist that I work with uh, once a week. I also work with a mental coach um, that helps me with my athletic side. And then my therapist helps me with my overall, you know, my feminine and maintaining relationships, you know, and things like that. Um, but, you know, I, I, I really am very grateful for the life that I have. And I mean, I have a dream job. I, I get to be you know, I get to assist. I mean, first of all, Phil is like a brother to me. I love him. I believe in him. Um, I've watched him and I'm just, and he's just, and, and I train with him. So like what other job would I want, you know, than to be able to help him succeed 
because he's always about helping me succeed. And now I get to help him succeed too. Which I think is a great relationship to have, right? When you're both singing from the same page. We're very similar. And, and you know, yeah, we're both very similar. And I love that, you know, Phil's a bit younger than me, but he respects my, my, my wisdom and he respects my experience and he respects my accomplishments. And he's been training me like we trained, we've been training two years consistently, but he's known me since 2016. And we've had, we've had a, a friendship since then. We trained together for uh, almost a year back then, but then I moved back to California. So we still stayed in touch and I always come to see him and he kept his eye on me. I kept my eye on him. And so he, he knows me, he knows me pretty well. So, so what sort of things, to, sorry, go on. Okay. I just had for him to put me in that position for me it says a lot. Yeah. So what sort of things are you, you, you two doing together training wise? Um, you know, we're doing, um, well, it's right there on the board. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Phil, he just sat there and did this whole thing. I love, he's so dedicated. Um, just training wise, um, you know, right now we're, we're, I'm, I'm off camp. I'm off camp. So we're doing a lot of, um, just variation work. You know, we do upper body, lower body. Um, we do stadiums or track work on Fridays, Saturdays. We do mostly conditioning type stuff. Um, we're actually working with, um, a gym, a gymnastics coach who Phil brought in because he wants to work on a little bit of gymnastics stuff with us. Which and flexibility stuff, stretching, which is great. He's always looking for ways to, you know, um, improve and increase. But he does his research. He does a lot, a lot of research. That's why I trust him so much because I see him, and he takes a lot of it very personal. You know, his 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 job, he feels, is to keep us safe and progressing. And he takes a lot on himself when if that happens, if a fighter, if a if an athlete gets injured, he immediately takes full responsibility. And I was talking to him about this. I was like, you really shouldn't. He goes, no, I have to. Because I have to help the fighter. I'm the leader. So I have to help the fighter figure out why. And he works really well with my boxing coach, Derek Santos, you know, because they're very much together and he trains all the fighters that Derek has. You know, I was I was the first one. And I remember when I first came out here and I worked with Derek, um, I told him, I said, listen, I, I work with Phil DeRue. So he's going to be my strength and conditioning coach. I'm not going to the track with your guys or going to the stadiums with your guys or running with your guys. I'm doing everything with Phil. And he was like, oh, well, he wasn't big on it. He knew Phil, but he was kind of like, he didn't know Phil like that. And he's like, you know, well, we'll do one of my strength and conditioning programs. I was like, okay, I've done these with boxing coaches and they're not good. They're just not, they make no sense. It's just work. It's work this, work that. There's no cohesion, none. Okay. So he did. And, and listen, that was great because Derek did what he could with what he had. I mean, he's a phenomenal boxing coach, but strength and conditioning, you know, I think boxing coaches should leave that to the strength and conditioning coach. But I think it's also important for the strength and conditioning coach to educate the boxing coach on what they're doing and why. So they have to be open-minded to have that relationship. Um, so I, I told him, I said after that, I was like, all right, let me go work with Phil. And he was still a little apprehensive because it's, a, again, just like I was with Paige. I'm like, well, this is my responsibility. If you're out there working with other people that I don't have connection with, how am I supposed to know that my job, my work is being protected? And, you know, so, um, so I said, okay, well, I'm going to work with Phil. And if there's a problem, that you see with my conditioning or my sparring or my strength, we can all sit as a team and we can talk about it. And he said, okay, the rest is history. <laughs> Here I am two years later. Now every boxer that trains with Derek is with Phil because he sees, he's like, wow, like Phil's real. Like it's real, like it's happening. So, um, so, you know, it's, it's great. I love, I love being in the weight room. I love, I love maxing. I love doing that. And you know, even, my my deadlifts like it helps me to be a better coach for Steffi you know because you know I know why she was uncomfortable in a in a in a in a slightly staggered stance you know um she, with a side stance I call blading because her strongest stance was sumo so she she wants a wide her want her she wants her legs wide and she wants to be a little bit more squared up and she said it to me she's like yeah this is not comfortable for me but she knew why I knew why but she said, yeah, because this is my strongest hand. I said, yeah, but that's not boxing. That's that's deadlifting. I mean, she knew. But I said, you can generate power from this stance. We just have to start working on your rotation because she's got no rotation because she never really did that. So, you know, it's it, but I get it. and she, But she gets it. Plus, she's a doctor of physical therapy, so she knows the body, you know, and, and she knows. I mean, it's just such a pleasure to work with her because she's so smart and she's so – and she's young and she's so, like, you know, um, self-aware. So it's really, but you know, I think because I understand powerlifting, 
because I do bench, I do deadlift, I do squat. I understand those motions, those movements, and I know what you feel like when you max. I mean, I don't lift anywhere near as much as she does, but you know, my 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 uh, my 135 bench, I'm proud of. You know, I got a I got a what a 295 uh, deadlift, I'm proud of. You know, but it worked to that, you know, and I understand like the problem with a boxer is that they're not stiff enough. So I lose my lats, I'm done, but she's too tight. So she's got to loosen up. So it helps me to be a better coach and to understand. So these are the things that, you know, applying and working and working on, you know, um, core stability, um, posterior chain work. It's been so important. My back, I'm, I find I'm more powerful now. So everything that Phil has really explained and what I was weak in and what I needed to adjust to be this and this it happened so the man knows something that's it he's got the secrets right the pot of gold <laughs> smart smart I'm grateful though I'm grateful and he's a great coach because listen you could be smart and you could be great at programming but if you could be a shitty person and not know how to deal with people he, he does that he does really well with that yeah Marie thank you for coming on today I really appreciate your time Sure, absolutely. Um, two minutes of your time, if possible, is yeah. basically for you to advertise yourself, where people can find you, if they want to contact you, if you're doing more podcast appearances or not, etc. I always like to give it to everyone. So, yeah, fire away. Yeah, so my Instagram is Maureen underscore Shea, M A U R E E N underscore S H E A. Um, I answer, I run my own, my, own, my own social media, so you can absolutely message me. Um, I get back to everybody. And, uh, Facebook, same thing, Maureen Shea, and I think Maureen, the real million dollar baby is my athlete page. Working on my website, SheaBoxing.com. I also do motivational speaking. I've been a speaker uh, for almost 15 years. Um, I've gone to schools. I've done a lot of charity work, um, and so it, that's another thing that uh, that I do too, sharing my story and sharing how to help motivate, inspire, and, and, and educate those around me um, in and out of the ring. Beautiful. Right, we'll end it there. If you're uh, fine for me to just have a couple of minutes chat with you um, off sure. air, that would be cool. Um, yeah, sure. I'll let you know when we've stopped recording. Uh, so yeah, three, two, one. Thank you everyone for tuning in. If you like the episode, give it a like and all that other stuff. And thank you for coming on. My pleasure. <laughs>